Please tell me that's not a Pontiac Fiero strapped to a rocket engine? My ass is in fuego! If you're anything like me, you probably dream about some of the super cool rides from the Fast and Furious movies. And for the most part, the team over at Universal Studios has done an incredible job choosing and designing cars for these movies. But there are some cars that were undeniably duds. In this vid, I'm going to take you through the worst of the worst cars from the Fast and Furious franchise and tell you exactly why they are so dang disappointing. And if you're new here, my name's Brad Danger. Smash that subscribe button, turn on that notification bell. These are the worst cars from the Fast and Furious movies, period. So buckle up and let's go. All right. Let's kick off this list with what is pretty much unanimously the worst car in any Fast and Furious movie ever. It's the 2005 Volkswagen Touran driven by Lil Bow Wow himself in Tokyo Drift. And it's better known as the Hulkmobile. Bruh. Yeah, I know you know what I'm talking about. And I don't know how much Universal paid Lil Bow Wow, but it must have been a lot to convince him to drive this absolute travesty. I mean, come on, Lucas Black gets to drive a 67 Mustang Fastback, and Lil Bow Wow gets stuck with a superhero-themed van that makes me question the director's sanity? Not fair. Apparently, this green hulk of garbage was stuck in the movie because director Justin Lin was a fan of the Hulk as a kid. I personally think that there were better ways to pay homage to your favorite superhero, maybe slap a sticker of him on the back of some sick tuner or something with some serious muscle, but instead they painted his face on a van that looks like it was dented up, and I think that little Bow Wow would agree. The next car didn't have a paint job quite as ridiculous as the giant Hulk face. In fact, it had hardly any paint at all. And if you remember the race scene in Cuba in The Fate and the Furious, then you probably remember Dom flying down a dirt road in a 1950 Chevy fleet line with the engine exposed. Throughout the race, there's a bunch of close-ups of what appears to be a turbocharged big block Chevy engine. But I hate to burst your bubble. The turbocharger was completely fake, kind of like my personality. I knew it! It was hollowed out and essentially just functional like an air intake. This means that fleet line was working with the 92 horsepower that it came with a half century ago. So it must have taken some serious movie magic to make a car that was underpowered and so rusted out to even look a little bit cool. And no, this vehicle is definitely not doing 100 miles per hour in reverse like Dom pulls in the movie. And it's starting to make me question what is real and what isn't real in movies these days. Are you serious? And with the exception of this particular 1950 fleet line, the 50s was a cool era in American car making. The same can't be said for the 80s though. Oh boy, that 1987 Chevy Caprice driven by the one and only ludicrous in Furious 7 is pretty much the pinnacle of everything that was wrong with the 80s American motors. Versions of the Caprice in the 70s was actually pretty cool. But the 80s came around and this car just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And the engine didn't grow to match the weight. The V6 that was stuck in the 80s models had a measly 140 horsepower. And it took about 11 seconds and then some to propel this thing to 60 miles per hour. And the interior is lined in cheapo leather and the fake wood accents everywhere will make you cringe. Believe it or not, Ludacris actually owned the 87 Caprice. Yeah, the actual one that they used in Furious 7. And to make it slightly better, he had a custom 350 horsepower crate engine added to it, and some Bassett racing wheels, and a Sidewinder shifter as well. But if you're as famous as Luda, and you can have any car you want, why go with this 80s bucket? I don't know. And while the mods on Luda's Caprice definitely made it better, the mods the production crew made to the BMW 3 Series in Too Fast and Too Furious should be straight up illegal. Now, this one makes me a bit sad. Craig Lieberman proposed that they use a replica of PTG E36 M3s, the legendary race car that proved themselves in the 24 hours of Daytona in 1995. But somehow, someway, I guess when he wasn't looking, they instead got a significantly less cool 323 E36 and tried to make it look like a BMW M3 by throwing on some massive wheel arches. And as a result, they had to fill those wheel arches with huge wheels. So they threw in some 20 inch chrome Giovanna wheels and made this car look extremely confusing to say the least. It's like the wheels of a Ronfla. No, God, please, no, no. And perhaps the worst part about this car is that it was an auto tragic, which if you wanna help save the manuals, go snag our best selling Ideal T. And with just how horrible this car was, it's no wonder it failed to sell at auction several times until finally they were able to pawn it off to some sucker for 11 G's. And I feel really sorry for that guy. But that's not the only car in the franchise with styling that 
was pretty nauseating. I'm talking about Tyrese Gibson's purple nurple from the Too Fast Too Furious. You know, the Mitsubishi Eclipse Spider. And everyone is entitled to their own opinion. At least that's what my mom tells me. And apparently Tyrese Gibson picked out the exterior design of the O3 Eclipse Spider himself. But if you ask me, which they didn't, but if they had, it's just way too much. And they were pretty much just putting lipstick on a pig anyways. This car is not fast and it is not a tuner car. I mean, if you listen to the engine, it sounds like a Subaru boxer motor with headers that are different lengths. And you're not gonna scare any bad guys away with that sound. Apparently this car had zero performance mods, but they stuck on some very expensive wheels, plus a giant racing wang and a big old muffler as well, making it basically a ricer? I'm sorry, Tyrese. And throughout their movies, Fast and Furious has been a beacon of hope for real tuner culture. But to see a car like this Eclipse Spider getting a leading role, it just it hurts my soul. And the next car on our list is an actual JDM legend, unlike the Eclipse Spider. And it should, yes, it should have been super badass, but they ended up putting an absolute travesty of a paint job on it instead. Now, don't get me wrong. We here at Ideal are huge fans of the first generation Acura NSX. It's an absolute legend in the JDM game. And it's proven itself on the racetrack as well as just being a super capable street car. And the guts of Tija's NSX and Too Fast Too Furious has nothing wrong with them at all. In fact, it's an extremely impressive car performance wise. But why on earth would you take such a cool car and give it this paint job? I guess they were going for something like a Louis Vuitton pattern, but in reality, it just looks like one of those tacky paint jobs from one of those old Pimp My Ride episodes. And to make matters worse, they threw this huge and useless scoop on top and then replaced the wheels with some big Giovanna chromes. And that totally clashed with the already awful paint job. And really, they just don't belong on any NSX whatsoever. And with all the aftermarket work done on the cars throughout this movie's franchise, it just boggles my mind how they could have screwed this one up so bad. Now, the next car on our list isn't just a single car, and it isn't really a bad car at that. The problem is, it shows up way too much. This is a Dodge Charger. No, I'm not talking about Dom's sweet 197 Charger RT from Fast Five, or the 69 Charger Daytona from Fast and Furious 6, or any of the classic Chargers you see throughout the franchise. Those are all very awesome. But I'm talking about the stock body chargers made after 2000 that appear in pretty much every movie since Fast Five. Now, these chargers aren't really bad cars. In fact, when I see one on the street, I think that they look pretty ideal. But I don't watch Fast and Furious movies to see cars that I see every day on the road. I wanna see unique tuner cars loaded with sick aftermarket mods blowing out ridiculous horsepower and flames. And it just seems like the producers were either getting a little bit lazy or they have a lucrative product placement deal with Dodge, which I think it may be the latter because there are just way too many chargers in the new movies. From 2010 Charger SRT8s in Fast Five to the 2012 Charger SRT8 LD in Fast and Furious 6 to the 2015 Charger LD in Fast 7. It's just overkill. And as much as we love some of the newer cars in the franchise, unfortunately, there's another newer model we wish never got an appearance. With all the incredible models on the aftermarket these days, why on earth would they choose to use a Maserati Ghibli as a major car in Furious 7? And as any serious car guy will tell you, the Ghibli is notoriously a hunk of junk. They're well known for their cheap interior quality, outdated technology, poor reliability, and entirely too high a price that depreciates so fast. If you were unlucky enough to pick up a 2014 Ghibli for its MSRP brand new, your car would have depreciated 60% by now. And that's because Maseratis across the board are extremely unreliable, and the Ghibli perhaps being the best example of that. Sure, a Maserati might look cool from the outside, but you're gonna be disappointed when the dashboard looks like a Christmas tree of warning lights. And the next car on our list was also a disappointment. But if this video isn't, hit that like button for the YouTube algorithm, we'd really appreciate it. Because this car's predecessor, the Mazda RX-7, yeah, I can see you getting excited, because it's one of the most legit JDM cars ever to come out of Japan. And it's a blast to drive and has some serious tuning ability. But when it comes to the release of the next generation, the RX-8, it seems like Mazda's engineers just took a few years off. The RX-8 was slower and less powerful than the RX-7, 
and it looked way less cool too, in my humble opinion. And it's really no wonder why the RX-8 never really caught on with the tuner community or the American market in general. Now its attempt to look like a fast driving sports car is betrayed by its asthmatic engine and poor driving dynamics. And while the paint job on this car wasn't as bad as the fake Louis Vuitton NSX, I'd still say they would have been better off without that gradient two-tone baby blue look. I'm sure there's an application for it somewhere, somehow, but not as a lead car for a Fast and Furious movie. And this next vehicle never should have been picked for these movies. The original design was just an absolute botch job by the British, and it made for a car that will just leave you scratching your head. That's ideal. Because upon first glance of a 71 Jensen Interceptor, you might say, oh, that's a pretty cool looking muscle car. But get into the details and you're gonna take that back real quick. This car just lacked an identity. It kind of looked like a muscle car, but also like a station wagon. In reality, it was called a Grand Touring. And I gotta say that it looks more like bland boring. The half-assed British electrical wiring makes this car incredibly unreliable. And while yes, they threw a pretty awesome Chrysler big block V8 into this thing and hooked it up to a 727 torque lifter automatic transmission, which has tree speeds, Whew. this was just an all around awful car from the jump and really had no place at all in a movie franchise for car guys. So which one is the worst car, truck, SUV of all time from the Fast and Furious franchise? Let us know down below, or did we miss one? Because we've been known to do that once or thrice. <laughs> also, if you're new here, I'm Brad Danger, this is Ideal. Hit that subscribe button, turn on the notification bell, and as always, keep living the ideal lifestyle.